Cool. All right, so a couple of months ago, I was binge watching all of Brett Victor's canon. Um, again, uh, raise your hand if you don't know who this guy is. Yeah, it, it's not really important for the talk, but I do encourage you to Google him. Uh, it's very insightful. It can only broaden your mind. Uh, but there is a very specific segment of one of his talks that caught my ear, and I want to sort of play it for you. I hope the sound is going to come out OK. Right, so um, I want to talk of what I feel is one of those examples of technologies that have led people in the Scala community into a tighter and tighter cage. And uh, to be specific, I want to talk about type classes and how they are currently encoding in, in Scala in all the libraries that I have come across so far. It's not a secret that Type classes are not like first-class citizens in Scala. Nobody is going to argue that they are implemented, uh, which means that you have a choice in how you want to implement them. Um, and depending on the choices that you make, there is no way around making some compromises. Um, but different compromises lead to different implementations. Uh, I'm going to walk you through what currently exists. And then we will see what happens when you make different choices. So to start with, let's go to the Scala website. Um, there is a page where effectively they call um, Scala's implicit the most distinguished Scala feature. Um, and it is described as a sort of low-level mechanism that is powerful enough to express pretty much everything that you want under, under the sun, one of them being type classes. And the language here is not prescriptive at all, um, and I think that's a sign that uh, they, they, they want to give the community the opportunity to come up with their own um, implementation. And yet, keep on visiting the website a bit further, you find that they actually come up with their own uh, version of encoding type classes. Um, so, yeah, uh, as a traits with type parameters, and that's it. <laughs> Problem solved, right? <sighs> no, not at all. Um, and in fact, let's take a look at the example that they give. In fact, they introduce the monoid type class. Doesn't really matter what that means, but here is the code sample. And there's already quite a lot of things that we can say about that. I'm just going to focus on three things. First is that there is not one trait. There, there are two traits. Um, and there's barely any mention of semi-group, uh, the first one. Second is there is this extension method inside the type class definition. Terrible idea. Uh, we're going to see why. You can see that these two traits are connected by extension, by subtyping. And this is going to be a major killer, um, as I'm going to argue with you. But probably the most like, glaring detail that I cannot gloss over is that there's, there's this capital G in semi-group. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> I mean, do you have no shame? <laughs> All right, let, let's, let's see how they come up with an instance for a type class. Uh, here it is. And 
suddenly what happened, there's, no, there's a single instance instead of two instances, right? We saw previously that there were two type classes, semi-group and monoid, and yet here, there's only one instance. You know why. Uh, as they are connected with, uh, you know, subtyping mechanism, uh, it would be quite jarring if you had to define each instance separately. You would only notice the accumulation of redundancy within uh, your code. That redundancy is ugly, disgusting, um, but it leads to a conclusion that we can make from, uh, from, you know, from that simple encoding. That conclusion is that there can only ever be one single object representing all the instances that your type ascribes to. Uh, you cannot go around that. I mean, you can try, it may compile, but you're never going to understand what instances is picked when depending on the use case. And it may lead some, to some compilation issues. Right, that is only the start of our problems. Um, let's look at, for example, the code on the CATS um, library. If you try to understand uh, or read, learn from the implementation, especially, especially the instances of these type classes, you will see these huge mega objects that are the combination of several of these traits. Um, it's not a choice made by the developers because it looks cool or because it's um, um, better that way. It's just that they have no other choice. When you have type classes uh, in a hierarchy that share a common trunk, if you follow the, um, if you follow the, the principle that there can only ever be one object uh, composing all your, all your instances, well, the natural conclusion is that you, the only way to have one object is to combine them all together. Now, the irony is not lost on me that, you know, we, we say that we are doing functional programming uh, by writing what amounts to object-oriented code, pretty much. This is like Java code to me. Not only that, but we are very far from one of the, I think, setting points of functional programming of building small, reusable, composable components, orthogonal components. That is disgusting, really. Um, I, I cannot imagine that anybody wants to read that code, let alone write that code. Maintain it, it must be a nightmare. And in fact, in my opinion, I haven't really asked, but that's one of the reasons why type classes in Scala are not pervasive. There is, uh, you know, most of the ex examples that you find in the wild are shallow uh, type classes with no hierarchy whatsoever. And one of the immediate consequences of that is uh, all your type classes is to be secluded within one library. Yeah? Because, let's say, you want to extend one of these type classes with another one that is more specific to a, a smaller subset of types, what are you going to do? Create a new library, but then you, <laughs> where are you going to put your instance? Uh, that can only lead to, to big problems. And because of that, I think that the ecosystem in Scala is kind of um, limited, and, and, and the usage of type classes is still in its infancy. Another thing that you will notice is that, I mean, that's the first thing that I saw when I looked at Zio Prelude. I was you know, trying to learn its um, set of constructs, um, and invariant is one of the simplest uh, type classes in the library, one of the most general one. And if you scroll down, you find that for each chunk, code sample, and you know, your first thought is, what the hell is for each? It doesn't have anything to do with invariant. Uh, so what you have to do is, you know, go to the for each file, understand that it's actually a subtype of invariant, and again, following the um, reasoning of having a single object, you know that for each is an invariant, which means that you have to create um, that invariant instance for chunk by proxy. 
But there is also another thing that comes um, in play with this. It is that you have to understand how the uh, Scala implicit resolution works, the implicit scope works. And if you do, then you know that the only choice you have to where you put that instance is in the companion object of the most, the top level um, type class that your type uh, ascribes to. And this is, this is insane. I mean, this is, who can understand that just by merely looking at the code? But also, what happens if you change for each? Suddenly you have to recompile, uh, in this case, invariant, everything in between. That, that doesn't make any sense. That's not efficient. That's not um, elegant. OK, um, I'm going to skip that. There's much to talk about. But um, yeah, um, the problem only gets worse when you start to have type parameters. And you have instances of type constructors that are you know, fully saturated with type parameters on which there are requirements, such as, for example, in here you can have a equality for either if both A and B have equality, and you can have ordering if both E and um, A and B have ordering as well, and E and order are uh, related by subtyping as well. Um, how do you deal with that? Well, you have to come up with another, another structure in your code that doesn't have any real meaning. It's just boilerplate to satisfy the compiler and help the implicit resolution mechanism. But in itself, it's completely useless. It doesn't bring any meaning to your instances. It, it's just one of these rituals that you have to memorize and keep track of. So all of these things, I find, are not only jarring, but disgusting, repelling. And in fact, when I think about Scala, when I look at that kind of code, I've, I've, I've tried to find the, the image that, you know, the, the, you know um, the, the, the feeling that I have every time I, I read that kind of code. And I, I, I cannot imagine that you know, people who maintain these libraries do not feel it in some way. Not only is it, it, does it require uh, an extraordinary amount of discipline, it also requires concentration. Like, you wouldn't go and ask the guy, oh, what's the color of your, of your suit? I like it uh, at that very moment because it could, it could ruin his life. But that's pretty much the same thing with a Scala developer writing type classes. But perhaps, perhaps there is a, a better way. Right. So let's start at the beginning and come back to our first example. I've cleaned it up a bit, removed the extension method, removed the capital G. Um, we know what the problem is, right? Um, there's no way around it. So let's just address it and nip it in a bud. All right. What happens when I remove this uh, subtyping relationship between type classes? Well, it, it turns out that um, pretty much all problems that I have outlined pre previously fall down like dominoes, right? So the first thing is that if I want to instantiate a semi-group for my data type as well as a monoid, yeah, again, taking the example of strings, I can do so, and these are cleanly separated. They are put where they belong in a companion object of the type class, and you don't have to know that you, know, mon you don't have to put your monoid into the semi-group object because that relationship between the two is completely lost. And that, that scales surprisingly well. That's how languages with first-class support for type classes work. You know, Haskell, uh, PureScript, Flix. Um, and this is very elegant because suddenly your code becomes as the functional programming paradigm promises, small, composable, and um, orthogonal. Moreover, um, this idea that a type class is a trait, uh, I, I'm going to challenge it. I don't think that it's an appropriate uh, representation. Um, sadly, in Scala, you have only two choices. But I find that having an abstract class 
is more appropriate. The reason being that you're never going to mix two type classes together. It's, it doesn't make any sense. Besides, there is, the, there is the keyword class. I don't know. I like it. There is another, another reason why I chose that encoding. I want to, of course, get back the relationship that I lost by getting rid of subtyping. Right? So if, if you think about it, subtyping encodes the notion of is a, like a, a monoid is a semi-group. I don't think this is appropriate. Um, in fact, you can come up with any example where it completely doesn't make sense. Let's say that you have a type class that has more than one type parameter. One of the type parameters has a requirement to be, I don't know, a monad. The other type parameter has a requirement to be a monoid. And having a type class that extends both monad and monoid doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Uh, there is no easy relationship between type classes. It's object-oriented. It's not functional. So it would be really nice if Scala had a mechanism to express dependencies that is not object-oriented. Oh, wait, I think I've got an idea. There it is, um, Scala's most distinguished feature. And for the hell of me, I cannot figure out why this isn't like the de facto encoding at this point in time. Mm. It does work really well, at least at the declaration side. We're going to see that there's a, a few wrinkles that we need to uh, figure out. Um, you don't have to believe me, though, that this is the correct encoding. Uh, I'm going to argue that this is the only and the best encoding that you can come up with in Scala. But you know, I'm, I'm a nobody. Um, However, in you know, the functional, world, functional programming world, there are people who have researched these things, who have um, um, explained these things in words that people can understand. And one of them is Oleg Kiselyov, a um, very famous author with a list of papers the size of my arm. And there is a very good uh, article where essentially it translates uh, how Haskell um, the, how the Haskell compiler works under the hood, he writes the equivalent in a language that doesn't have type classes, in, in, this, uh, in this case, OCaml. And this, you know, this translation is illuminating because it gives us the answer that we are looking for. Let's take a simple example of this class where we have a requirement on the type A uh, that it has to ascribe to two type classes if you want to write an instance of, of that multi-class. The equivalent OCaml, I mean, OCaml being a, an object-oriented type, if we were to trust Scala, you would have to come up with some class with a subtyping relationship. But in this case, it's just a, a simple record type, hmm? nothing surprising, where uh, the functions of the type class are just, is just a, a simple member to that record. And the relationship with the super classes, again, are just uh, regular values passed as members to the record type. Here is the Scala translation. Again, this is a direct translation, and it works really well. Uh, it reads really well. It's declarative. You cannot not understand that. I'm going to skip that. OK, um, so this encoding, as I said, scales beautifully well. But you remember at the beginning, I uh, mentioned that you have to make some compromise. Um, and this is no exemption, exception. So let's go through them. Well, first, first off, um, this code with this encoding is not going to compile. We have to work a bit. It's not the going to compile. Um, for the reason that we have kind of lost that um, the, the relationship that we have with subtyping here is expressed by means of the uh, implicit values that are bundled inside the monad instance. They are not available to the user code, and we are going to see why and how to address that. So first, let's have a look at the encoding that I 
have for these uh, type classes. So at the top of the hierarchy, we have functor. At the bottom, we have this monad. In between, there is this applicative, which is a kind of an in-between uh, type class. And uh, each subclass has this implicit uh, evidence that it, it is connected to, or it, it requires, oh no, sorry, it provides an instance of its upper class. Now, we know that a full comprehension is just syntactic sugar, so the first thing we need to do is have some extension methods. There is no way around it, not that I know of. Uh, and unfortunately, we have to add it to the class itself. Um, and notice that, that I, I provide the implementation. I don't want the user to have to do it. It's just, it's just too much boilerplate to write an extension method. It doesn't feel correct uh, when you ask the user to write it on your behalf. I wish we could move them to the companion object. In my opinion, it would be more, uh, it would be cleaner, but this is the way it is. And besides, I don't think there is a way to make, mark them as final. All right, but we can do that, um, but still, the compiler will not like it. So first, let me rewrite this sample code into the style that I uh, like. Um, I've been reading a lot of Flix and, and Unison lately, uh, toying with the languages, and I find that having instead of using extension methods all over the place, I find that having uh, functions defined into the companion object of each type class is way more, um, is way cleaner. And uh, having these scoped imports helps me understand the code. It helps me also discover uh, what these functions do and how they um, are available for users. But still, this is not going to compile. The reason being that even though we know that inside our monad, object evidence there, there is a, an applicative uh, object, the compiler cannot find it. Unfortunately, we understand that the Scala compiler doesn't have what I call transitive scope, where if you have a, an implicit evidence in scope, it's not going to look into that evidence for more implicit evidences, which is unfortunately the missing ingredient for having something that compiles. So we will have to do essentially a bit of manual work to give access to that uh, evidence. And again, we can look at the code that uh, Oleg wrote. I'm not going to show you, but essentially what he does is just unpacks the record because he has direct, direct access to the values. Some of those values are type class instances. He can, he can then pass them manually to, um, to the functions that are called inside the implementation. All right, so what I want to do is I want to give access to the implicit evidences inside my implicit evidence. In Scala 3, you can import givens. It should give you access to all uh, these implicit evidences, but somehow it still doesn't work. And the reason for that is one of those mechanical um, features that you really don't want to know about that is typically object-oriented is that uh, inside a class, if you do not prefix your members with val, they are by definition private. Uh, this works in an object-oriented context, but it doesn't work in a functional context because here we just want to pass dictionaries and the compiler should be able to find them should be able to override that uh, object-oriented uh, semantic. So what's the solution? Well, we have no other choice but to um, name our implicit evidence and mark it as a value of our class. Suddenly, it becomes public. Now, when you do that, still doesn't compile, but the, the error message is different. It doesn't find the map. Um, and if you remember correctly, the extension method map was defined in fact functor. So now we have access to the applicative evidence, but we don't have access to the functor evidence, another occurrence of that transitivity issue. Now, I could probably add a, another import to my function, but at this point, I, I decide that it's just too much work for the user of my type classes, and I don't want to add more burden to it. I think that this import is already too much, but that's the sacrifice I'm willing to make. So instead, I decide to roll up 
all my implicit evidence, uh, evidences inside the bottom uh, evidence for my monad. Here, I just roll up all the ev evidences um, from um, the bottom to the top, namely applicative and functor, and then now suddenly my code compiles. So, as a summary, here are the uh, two compromises that I have to make. First is that if you have a, a, a hierarchy of type classes, um, you have to name each evidence uh, that you pass as implicit in your bottom type classes, in your subclasses, and you have to accumulate them the further down you go into the hierarchy. I think that compared to the cost of, you know, all this boilerplate and all this ceremony um, that you get with using a subtyping relationship for encoding type classes, this is a sacrifice that is still paying off uh, in terms of clarity and conciseness. And finally, the second um, sacrifice is that you have to add that import statement uh, when you use abstract code. And sadly, um, that's the only thing that you need to do. But if you accept these two small things, then it works, and it works quite well. It's enjoyable for type class authors, and it's also enjoyable for type class uh, users. And in fact, the first time I, I wrote that code and I saw that it was working, I was like, OK, this is the kind of Scala that I want to write. I want to share it with you today. And hopefully, I don't know, perhaps, um, um, perhaps the Zio Prelude library would be interested in giving it a try. <laughs> Right, so that's, that's all I have. Um, my name is Regis, just in case it wasn't clear. And um, yeah, if you have, if, I don't know if you have time for questions, but thank you very much for listening. Thank you.